Coming up on Digital Music Trends 191 on the 9th of July 2014, we chat about US music sales in the first half of 2014, MCNs and Wrightster's acquisition of Base 79, Ariana Grande's campaign, Taylor Swift's editorial, Samsung pushing on milk, rap genius reaching deals with all major publishers and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps including Downcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more and if you'd like to receive the weekly mail out of DMT you can find that on bit.ly slash DMT list, you can subscribe and you'll get a weekly email with everything that's been going on on the DMT uh, channel uh, for that given week and uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show two great guests and uh, uh, first up it's uh, fantastic to have uh, Theda Sunniford on the show VP of Digital Marketing at Republic Records so hi Theda and th thanks for joining us Thank you for inviting me back I, I feel like I only get to see you during South By so it's nice <laughs> to be able to see you today. Exactly, yeah, and uh, you're, you're in New York and uh, I'm, I'm enjoying a, a quiet drink here in London, so it's all good. And uh, yeah, I'm actually uh, uh, really excited to also welcome uh, to the show uh, Dave Haynes, the Head of Business Development at Makeshift.io uh, and previously many listeners will know him as uh, uh, the uh, uh, previous VP, VP of Business Development at SoundCloud. So hi Dave and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hey, very good. Yeah, good to be back on. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it feels like I used to be a regular listener of the show and, <laughs> and maybe I listen, I don't have to listen to it as often or exactly. keep up with the music news <laughs> as often. So um, yeah, it's been really good to have a, a good excuse to do that again. And it's going to be exciting to hear your perspective actually because, uh, you know, as somebody that used to be completely immersed in this world and now I can actually take a bit of an outside perspective, it's going to be great yeah, to hear exactly. your yeah, thoughts. I, <laughs> I, I was thinking about that as I was chewing through that, that week's new music news. I, I still read I still read the news and I, I get Darren yeah. Hemmings' is digest every week and you know yeah. skim over music ally but it felt like there was a time where i would consume every single piece of digital music news exactly um <laughs> and then now it's yeah you, you realize um you know that can be quite a bubble so it's nice to be outside that bubble for exactly. uh, looking in and uh, we can this... fill you in on anything you might be missing oh yeah <laughs> i'm sure i'm right. sure we can and actually it's going to be quite a fun show because uh, it's, it's a fairly light news week so we can actually we actually get to chat a little bit about uh, what you uh, both are up to as well which is going to be fun, and right. so uh, and I, I, I managed to uh, I managed to sidestep all the SoundCloud news, which is, is exactly. probably yeah. a good thing. So I don't say <laughs> anything I shouldn't say. Perfect. <laughs> that was last week, so yeah, uh, no, it's, it's 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 all good. And so first of all, I wanted to uh, start by talking about uh, the U.S. music sales. So, so uh, Nielsen SoundScan released its uh, usual mid-year report uh, this week, which compares the first six months of 2014 with the same period in 2013. And so uh, U.S. listeners streamed over 70 billion tracks online a 42% increase on 2013 and these actually are split fairly evenly between the audio on demand and the video on demand spaces so uh, that was something that I found particularly interesting uh, is the fact that uh, growth in uh, on demand audio has been much greater than that of uh, video on demand so uh, uh, video on demand grew 35% over uh, th uh, 2013 uh, this year and audio on demand grew 50% so uh, as a consequence there actually isn't a huge uh, gap between uh, you know the number of streams made on, on one type of service uh, to, to the other, which is uh, surprising for me anyway. Uh, digital track sales fell 13% uh, year over year in 2014 with uh, digital album sales declining 11.6% in the same period and the CD market continues its uh, you know decline and unfortunately uh, the album sales lost 19.6% year on year in the first uh, six months of 2014. Uh, interestingly though both uh, uh, digital album sales and CD sales uh, kind of declined so um, CD sales actually are still the most popular format for albums with uh, 62.9 million sales and so you know, uh, of course, uh, and finally, vinyl is the one massively bright spot, although, you know, uh, comparatively, uh, sales are just 4 million units, which is uh, uh, not as much as, uh, as uh, of course, uh, albums, uh, uh, CD albums. And so uh, even though, uh, you know, a few writers took these numbers to still look at this as being a doom and gloom situation, actually, there's been a general reaction of, of uh, you know, a measure or you know reaction uh, are out there uh, people are not panicking they're just uh, taking these numbers as they are and trying to make the most of them so uh, as far as what your your reactions are around these uh, what do you think they tell us about the changes in consumer habits in the US uh, Theda do you want to do you want to take this first well um, first of all, I'm going to say I'm not surprised by any of these numbers this right. is how it's been trending over the last two years that I've been actually looking at it from 
what Republic's doing um, and in within the UMG uh, universe and then within the larger music business, our focus has largely been the last year to drive streaming. Yeah. Um, we're seeing consumption patterns of uh, consumers changing um, where their first screen is their mobile phone and the streaming services are very apt to kind of feed into that funnel from your mobile phone as opposed to the downloading which is far more efficient um, uh, on a desktop, um, especially if you have an iPhone, there, there's you know, there's some complications with the with uh, how you download and get that come back into your player. Um, so this the numbers aren't surprising. In fact, to me, I think they're somewhat encouraging um, because we're seeing very rapid proliferation and adoption of streaming services like Spotify. Um, and some of the numbers that you're seeing, I mean, if we have this conversation again in six months, uh, you're going to probably see a huge jump from January, uh, really after some time in April, uh, right. because they changed their pricing model. Um, so teens and college students are able to uh, subscribe for four ninety nine a month, um, and that's a very competitive price. Um, and then with Apple uh, buying Beats, uh, when they figure that whole piece out and how they're going to integrate that into what they're doing, it's all making it very competitive. Um, and the cream rises to the top and the consumers are learning how to actually um, uh, to use these services and the particularly ones that they're paying for. Right. You know, if you're paying four ninety nine a month, uh, two years ago if you said, hey, I can get all the music I want for $10 a month, most consumers would be like, what's the catch? And I think now with uh, the pricing being uh, more upfront and bundle deals that are happening for family plans, people are realizing that it's actually really good value for the money. Yeah. And, and Dave, uh, it's funny because 18 months ago, uh, everybody was running scared that, you know, uh, uh, worried that uh, uh, streaming was cannibalizing downloads, which, have, uh, you know, inevitably ended up happening. So uh, how do you see these, these new numbers and, and how do you think that the industry will, will take to them? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting reading the article. I have to say, with, with these types of articles, I tend to glaze over because there's so many numbers yeah, and so many percentages. Right. And, it, and it almost feels like, I mean, I think Mark Mulligan wrote that this was the, the 14th year of, of consecutive like, decline. So it's not like these, this was unexpected. And like Theda said, you know, I think most people in the, in, in the industry know this. And, you know, I think that the big challenge is, has really been... Um, especially for the last couple of years, is like how quickly can everyone um, like transition their business? Because yeah. the writing was on the wall, you know, there's, there's a significant trend that's happening. And I think most, you know, the smart people are looking ahead of that curve. So, yes, we know where it's going to go. It, we know where it's probably going to bottom out. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, smart people doing the economics around that. I think one thing that, that I, I kind of worry about when I see these numbers is all the kind of the, the focus and the effort going into, I think that the, the, the music industry is really always focused on it being a transactional business. So right. how many units have shipped and how many units are sold and, and things like that. And I'll come on to the streaming subscription in a minute, but I think there's, you know, there is a move now to more kind of ad supported services, yeah. um, you know, moves to other types of ways of monetizing, um, you know, the audience in the music industry. So I worry a little bit if people are too focused on these as the kind of leading key metrics, they might be missing up other opportunities that are ahead of the curve and other revenues that can come in to, to actually substitute this. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so I think, uh, and, and again, I think it was in a Mark Mulligan PC, and he pointed out two very important things that, um, you know, the subscription side of it, you know, a $9.99 um, or, you know, whatever that kind of more premium price point is for the music subscription, that's always going to be a niche product. Um, it's definitely got room to grow. And yes, there's like students who can take more of a mid price. There's a lot to be done around bundling and family prices and things like that. But I think ultimately we're going to need to see more like differentiated prices. So yeah. I would love to see a new wave of services that had a had a lower price point than than five dollars. Yeah. Um, and then it's just about how do you differentiate those and how do those not cannibalize the the more expensive services. Yeah. Uh, but then lastly, just the you know the advertising and ad ad supported services that that can reach 
a much wider scale. Um, and of course, as everyone knows, the challenge is, you know, what, like, what is your kind of average revenue per user? You know, if, if you can get more scale, um, you know, can you get enough revenue with it? So, yeah. um, I don't know, I think these, these, these articles are interesting, but it can be, um, yeah, I, I, I sometimes worry that people in the industry, um, you know, focus on the wrong metrics at times. Yeah, sure. I mean, actually, uh, you point out something that I was going to uh, follow up with uh, uh, with a question, which is uh, talking about uh, internet radio. So, of course, these numbers do not take into account anything, uh, any data coming from the likes of Pandora and iHeartRadio. And, of course, Pandora, with 70 plus million uh, unique listeners in the U.S. per month, makes up a, you know, a pretty hefty portion of the digital consumption for uh, for the U.S. So, uh, Theta, what do you think about that? And how do you think that these uh, uh, alternatives, means of consumption that are not transactional based, uh, but pay to sound exchange, it can be incorporated into the picture to to figure out really what's going on. Well, it's it's interesting. Is uh, you know the the RIAA is here in the states is is in a constant sort of tail chasing the dog with um, with Pandora about the per track rates that they are paying to Sound Exchange, and so obviously the industry would like to have more. Um, and Pandora claims that they can't do that because they are an ad supported model and not able to monetize their service. So, um, you know, part of me feels like figure out how to monetize your service, uh, especially with uh, connected radio devices in cars. Um, you can uh, through the phone. There's a lot of different opportunities if they're smart to geo. Target and be able to offer contextual advertising to actually make more revenue off their services, and and I just haven't seen any of these um, ad-supported services uh, successively do that yet. Now, uh, the new SoundCloud supposedly does do that, um, and I've seen some of the slides that describes how they plan on doing that, um, but it hasn't launched yet. Um, so I kind of feel like. My answer is um, I'm keen to see what it will be like and how well the services monetize the eyeballs uh, and the ears yeah. that they actually have. And it's kind of on them to figure that out. Yeah. Um, uh, we, on the other hand, you know, on the label side are constantly trying to change what kind of metrics people are paying attention to by driving the most amount of streams. Yeah. Um, driving that consumption and actually show how that correlates to other areas um, in the supply chain. Right. So it might be how a Spotify stream might impact YouTube or Vivo or vice versa, or how something we're doing that we're trying to engage audience uh, and fans around user-generated content then can actually tie back to actual streams yeah. um, that is monetized. So uh, I, I say it's very early days. We're testing a lot of things. We're testing and failing, testing and failing and re rejiggering it and uh, pivoting pretty much every day. And I, I feel like a good six months from now, I could probably say, here's the playbook. Right. It's great. And then it's going to change again. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so as soon as we figure it out, it changes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dave, uh, what are your thoughts? You know, you travel to the U.S. quite a lot uh, around internet radio and how th those stats can be sort of integrated to give us a better picture of, of what's really going on in the digital consumption side of things. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, just uh, I guess just more of a general statement, I think, kind of responding to what Theo said there. I mean, there's there's a lot of smart people now thinking about this. And it's I think over the, the last couple of years, um, you know, she rightly pointed out, it's been a massive learning experience. And, and all of this is new. Right. So it's yeah. everyone's having to transition. Everyone's having to learn at the same time. So um, I think we, we are getting into a phase now where things are you know, a lot of the disruption, you know, happened over the last four years and things are getting a bit more stable now. So, so you know, the, the, the smart people in the room can get together no matter where they are, you know, whether it's a radio service, whether it's on demand, whether it's at, at the labels. And, and hopefully, I, I mean, I, I feel optimistic um, about the future. And I think, I think yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot out there that, you know, there's a lot of value that we haven't captured yet. Yeah. Um, but, but everyone wants the same thing. Everyone wants to go out and figure it, figure it out. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and sort of following on from from talking about how to monetize uh, uh, audio, uh, you know, streaming audio better. Uh, I also I wanted to uh, shift gears and talk about uh, MCN. So uh, multi-channel networks sort of became the uh, buzzword of sort of late 2012 to up to mid 2013, and everybody was talking about MCN. 
MCNs and the rise of these huge, uh, you know, uh, aggregators of content and uh, uh, channels on YouTube that could actually uh, 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 allow artists and uh, other forms of content to monetize, uh, the, you know, their videos better. And, uh, uh, you know, this week it was announced that digital video distribution and monetization company Rightster has acquired multi-channel network base 79 for around 50 million pounds. Uh, Rightster is a public company and plans to issue 75 million new shares to raise uh, 42 million pounds uh, that will pay, I guess, for the acquisition. And this creates the biggest MCN outside of the US, according to the company, and the fourth biggest in the US. So, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the evolution of the MCN space in the uh, last year and a half. Rystar is an interesting company because from the very beginning it set out to distribute and monetize video across multiple platforms uh, and outlets uh, and not just YouTube, whilst a lot of MCNs base essentially 99% of their business on YouTube. Uh, you know, what challenges do they face and, and how do you see that space evolving over the, over the next uh, uh, couple of years? Uh, I don't know if, uh, who wants to take that one first. Anybody? <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, I, just, I can. Oh, go, go on. Ahead, go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead, Dave. <laughs> Marvelous. Um, yeah, I mean, I, for, for me, I mean, that space has been just like fascinating over the last couple of years. Um, you know, the, the fact that there has been, you know, I, I think, you know, the MCNs would like to say that they've, you know, they diversify and they monetize video across many different platforms. But I think, you know, the reality is a lot of that business has come from YouTube. Um, I think mean, the one part that I've always been really interested in is how they've been doing uh, a really interesting job for like this kind of long tail of creators, like these right. these new people. Like I have a five year old son and he watches, you know, these these guys who are playing Minecraft and commentating on them and they have millions of mi like their, their audience is huge. Um, you know, they're like he's not kind of sitting down and um you know watching traditional tv he's he's on youtube and and those people are completely new talent who are monetizing in a completely new way so so for, for me that was really interesting and, and also a lot of lessons there um like for artists and for musicians uh, to take out of that yeah. um i guess for for base 79 um because they've been around quite a long time i think they were started in 2007 um, I think they focused, and because they were here in the UK, I think they focused more on like working with like brands that had premium content. Um, so a lot of um, you know bigger media brands here um, in the UK and people like Ministry of Sound and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean in in the US, it feels like the MCN thing has been much bigger um, with you know the full screens and makers and, and people like that. So yeah, it's been a it's been a fascinating space. Absolutely. I think the 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 sale price was was fifty million, but only half of that. Was, cash. was cash and and the other half was on on performance so it doesn't feel like it was a huge um you know exit for base 79 it feels like it was more of a a consolidation play yeah. um you know two companies getting together um you know to make what they do i think we we saw a lot of that consolidation you know with with a lot of the indie aggregators and you know people like orchard Nyoda. so i guess this is this is a, a similar similar time for the mcns yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, uh, even Raster hadn't taken up, uh, you know, a huge amount of funding yet. So, you know, it, its market cap is not huge. So th this represents almost a, almost like a merger, t merger type of situation in the sense that it's yeah. just such a huge acquisition for them. And uh, uh, and uh, but Theta, of course, for uh, for you working uh, at Universal, I guess Vivo is the, the I guess, the primary uh, MCN in a sense. And, and how do you see that space uh, sort of uh, coming together? Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, we put most of our videos through v, through Vivo and then they go on to the YouTube channels and a Universal Music Group, uh, essentially all their labels and artists that are affiliated. Um, in a sense, that is its own MCN. But one of the trends I'm seeing is MCNs that are living on other types of video networks, uh, like, like Vine in particular. Right. Um, and that now is becoming a thing. Um, in the last, I guess, three to six months, um, I have been approached by a number of different companies that are representing multiple uh, Vine artists, um, as well as Instagram artists, and for short form video content. Right. Um, and uh, and monetizing that. And I feel like, you know, I, I don't want to say the MCM. Uh, ship has sailed but that to me feels like two years ago um because a lot of partners have already been signed up and and yeah. a lot of newer uh different types of short form content that appeals to an even younger audience than the youtube audience um there are these new mcns coming up for vine and instagram yeah i, I think it's very interesting 
That's that. No, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. as you as you mentioned, there is a only a limited, uh, relatively limited pool of uh, uh, talent out there, and uh, there's some huge channels already, uh, you know, signed up to uh, most of these MCNs, and so we'll see how that market develops and how it manages to find a, a way to expand. And uh, uh, actually, you know, from this news, I wanted to take a, a little break uh, uh, from the news and, and stop for a chat. And so, uh, Theda, uh, you were mentioning uh, some work you've been doing lately with uh, Arena Grande, and of course, uh, I'd love to for you to elaborate on sort of what's been going on in the last uh, few weeks with her release and sort of how you've been uh, setting that up? Uh, well, it's been a team effort. Um, I mean, all hands on deck. Yeah. Um, from our radio press department, our video department, uh, marketing teams, digital, uh, everyone you could possibly think that could touch this girl's life. Um, but we had a huge rollout last week with uh, MTV globally. Uh, we took over the Times Square station, uh, studio and brought back uh, Total Ariana Live. Um, and, and basically broke the internet. Um, and one day we drove one billion uh, Twitter impressions wow. on the hashtag Total Ariana Live. And you know, I thought we would be like maybe 500 million. I thought maybe 700. But when I went, I had to run the report <laughs> twice just to make sure I wasn't making a mistake. And I was, oh, holy crap, one billion impressions wow. in one day um so it really just goes to show you that if you have something new and exciting to share and the fans are just ravenous about it using both television online fully integrated uh 360 type campaign you can drive an amazing amount of awareness and discussion and so where where all those channels that you you mentioned those outlets were, were they all pointing to twitter um, well, Twitter was just one of the areas where we saw where we were trying to directing the conversation. She's yeah. very active on her Twitter. Right. Um, we were running a campaign to offer people who were in Times Square um, if they there were billboards running in Times Square, so that if you tweeted certain hashtags, it would give you a preview to the song, so that if you couldn't get into the studio yourself, you can still have that experience through Twitter. Um, so that was a pretty interesting uh, integration. A lot of times on the digital side, we are really focused on, you know, what we can do within our own platforms, right. online, mobile phone, tablets, and all our marketing is around those things. This was a real opportunity to work offline, on online, broadcast, everything. social, <laughs> and really bring everything together to drive a result. And because we had all those touch points covered, I mean, we broke the internet, or at least broke Twitter. It was a. She had three worldwide trends um, in one day, like last Wednesday. Wow, um, which is pretty unheard of. And it's, of course, it's awesome when it, when it works, when it catches on, because uh, you probably only get like two or three. You know, releases a year that you can do that kind of coordinated effort on. So, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, listen, this is all earned media. Yeah. None of it was paid. So. Um, you know, oftentimes we're, we're asked to how do we, you know, throw some fire or gasoline on that campaign and make it go, go further. We often as digital marketers think, well, let me put some money behind that. And it just goes to show you just a little creativity and too many meetings and lots of emails We're trying to coordinate efforts and the timing and the rollout of things that you actually can do something really, really big. Um, and not have to, you know, go by SEM to actually support the campaign. Absolutely, that, that's fantastic, and thanks so much for sharing that. And uh, uh, Dave, I want to ask about uh, what you're up to now on Makeshift.io. If people haven't heard about uh, the company uh, that are listening to the show right now from uh, wh wherever they are in the world, uh, wh wh what does it do? Yeah, so I mean, Makeshift for me has, has been quite an interesting challenge because it's taken me outside of the, the music industry, but going back to like the you know the startup world when i joined soundcloud we we're only eight people so this is kind of going back to that really early stage of trying to think about companies and internet products and you know how do you how do you get an mvp out how do you test it um and then how do you build businesses out of those things so um it's quite quite exciting that makeshift as a company we've over the last 18 months we've actually kind of built 12 like completely new internet products 
um, shipped them, tested them, and and like at the beginning of the year when I came in, we were down to five, and, yeah. and now we're kind of in the in the mindset of trying to focus on building those into businesses. So so for me, it's been really interesting, and, and like I said, not reading any of the, the the digital music news to have to do that. So just thinking about lots <laughs> of other things. Um, but in the meantime, I keep getting drawn back into the into the, the the music industry space and the music creator space. So I've also been in my in my spare time doing um, a, quite a bit of you know just advising and mentorship and stuff like that of other really interesting interesting music startups um, that I'm seeing coming through. So it's been nice just to completely separate myself from, um, you know, all of the, everything going on in, uh, you know, with SoundCloud and, and in the, the kind of, you know, the broader digital music industry and just really focus on some new things that are coming through. That's great. And what's exciting you right now in the, in the music tech space, if you, if you look at the broader picture and sort of uh, from, from uh, uh, somebody that is, doesn't have an, an interest in that space uh, uh, directly? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess like most of the news focuses on, you know, the consumption services yeah. and new recommendation services and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of stuff around like the live industry. Um, but I think the the area that interests me most is um, uh, just, I, I think there's a wave of innovation that's yet to happen around like music creation. Um, so anything through from, you know, kind of like new music instruments. There's a, a company right. called Roly um, uh, based down the road here in London, Dalston. Um, who have just raised actually quite a, uh, quite a lot of money. Yeah. Um, I forget how much. I think it was like $12 million, um, including investment from Universal Music itself, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but they're, they're essentially innovating new musical instruments. So they yeah. have a, a keyboard called the, the Seaboard, the Seaboard Grand, um, and it's just redefining how people um, you know, play the keyboard, essentially. Yeah. So um, that's really interesting. And um, I will get them on the show at some point. I, I, I meet them every, about every four or five weeks, but... Uh, <laughs> I yeah, yeah, to record his shows. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're they're really great guys as well. So I'm I'm yeah. excited to see what what comes from from there. Um, and then another company which I've been working a bit more closely with is um, uh, called Mix Genius, and they have a product called Landa, um, which helps this this kind of long tail of musicians and artists. Um, to just very easily master their music. So yep. if I'm a musician, I've just got a track out the studio. Um, I just want to publish it, get it out there, or, or send it on to somebody. Um, you know, without having to spend hundreds of pounds going into the mastering studio, I can just upload it to the web, get a version back instantly. A B the tracks, and, and you know, then I can go and publish a, a much nicer version of my track. So, yep. um, so, so yeah, some really interesting things happening. I think. Absolutely, and uh, again, I need to get Landra on the show as well. I met those guys about three weeks ago and tried out the product. And works really great right. and right. Uh, great awesome so I wanted to follow up actually on, on this chat and, and what uh, Theta was saying uh, uh, by talking about uh, the Taylor Swift uh, uh, Washington uh, Wall Street Journal uh, um, editorial piece that she published uh, that has really made the round of course it's Taylor Swift one of the most popular artists uh, in the world and so if she does write a post about the future of the music industry then uh, people are going to repost it and uh, 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 you know uh, <laughs> pick it up from uh, pretty much any outlet uh, that uh, writes about music so uh, she made some noise uh, by uh, you know, talking about uh, her thoughts uh, on, on how uh, music sales are progressing. Of course, I don't want to summarize the post uh, too much, uh, but I know there might be some listeners that are, uh, I don't know, at the gym or running around whilst they listen to the show. And uh, so she made like four points, essentially. The first one, the music should not be free because music is valuable and rare. Uh, it's a form of art. Uh, the second, that fans will keep buying albums if uh, they hit her, if, if they're hit by uh, the music, in her words, uh, like an arrow through the heart. And third, that it's important to create unique moments all the time. Uh, today especially on the road so you have to really uh, focus on uh, not just repeating the same set over and over again and bringing new people on tour and making interesting shifts because people so see so much stuff online already and finally uh, she uh, of course stressed that it's important to keep contact with fans and you know uh, she's got over 40 million uh, followers on Twitter so she's definitely uh, pretty good at that and uh, so uh, a lot has been said about uh, this this article. Of course, there are some things that are missed out. Uh, uh, you know, there's th there's a much of a perspective around uh, artists that are perhaps starting out or having a hard time uh, monetizing the music. But uh, as far as uh, your thoughts are, uh, once you read it, what what do you make of it? And uh, uh, of course, it's it's a pretty positive take on uh, the future of the music industry going forward. Uh, Theda. I absolutely love Taylor Swift, uh, and what when I read the article. Um, it, it wasn't like someone put those words in her mouth. That really is her. Yeah. And every, every point she makes, it's like she practiced what she preaches. Like she's absolutely incredible with her fans. She shares intimate moments of her life. Um, 
you know, if you're not already following her on Instagram, you should because she's it's you're even you're able to see it um, more so than just her talking about it. Um, so I, I I feel like she's dead on. And, um, you know, it's one of the things that we, it's one of the messages that I share with some of our other artists and managers about being authentic and sharing their truth and letting fans in on a big secret so that they feel an emotional connection. Um, the re you know, music does a good job of selling every other, everything else but itself. And uh, it, the job of the artist is really to sell themselves. It's really the music almost is, for lack of a better term, almost a loss leader in a way because people are buying in on the individual and the person. And Taylor really understands this. Um, so when she interacts with her fans, from what you see, what she does from a live show or yeah. backstage when she's meeting not just fans but uh, uh, VIPs and other people, she makes every single individual person feel like she is there for them. And it is a rare gift. Um, I, I wish more artists knew how to do that. And she does it in such a way that does not seem affected. It's really just, that's just who she is. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I wish more artists would kind of realize that the, it is not just about the song anymore, that it really is about the lifestyle that uh, and the connection that they make with uh, with their fans, that you can have a, 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 an, un, a, an unsuccessful project, but if, they, if some, uh, one song may not get a ton of uh, play at radio, but because your fans feel like, they're along for the ride they will support you in other ways yeah yeah exactly so uh yeah she she's extraordinary uh, and i i sent that link to every single one of my artist managers this week <laughs> so uh, i mean that, that's the thing you know even though of course uh, from from when i was looking at it i was thinking of course you know this is an artist that is one of the most successful artists on the planet and so it's hard f I, I, I was wondering whether it was that, possible for her because to... of the tactics she's talking about is yeah. one of the reasons why she is the most successful artist yeah <laughs> uh, she writes songs that connect to people emotionally and when they share of that oh this song changed my life for this she acknowledges that and feeds on that to share more of her own personal experience through her music and uh you know s s not every artist does that successfully she's found a way to do that where it's authentic um and it really is extraordinary Dave, well, what are your thoughts? Uh, of course, an interesting publication as well, the Wall, the Wall Street Journal. Not not often we see uh, these kind of editorials come up. Yeah, I mean, I was yeah, I was I was pleasantly surprised reading the the article. I think I thought it was um, you know a very positive piece. Um, yeah. I think she used the word um, you know enthusiastic optimism, um, which I really like because yeah, like if you're if you're you can you can see you know with all the uncertainty and all the you know these changes and you know revenue in decline, you know it's it's yeah. easy to switch to kind of you know half glass empty mode. Um, but yeah, I think we we need more artists who are who are definitely in the kind of half glass full yeah. um, mode. So yeah, that that was really good. I mean, there was there was you know some kind of um, contentious stuff around you know the value of uh, value of music and i guess that's that can be quite um quite a subjective thing yeah um but yeah i, I thought what what re i really liked about it was it's just somebody from a, a slightly different generation like a lot of these op-ed pieces we've seen <laughs> have been from bigger more established artists who have come from a slightly different generation and almost a different time and are carrying a lot of the baggage of what the music industry used to be to reflect, you know, their views on, on what it currently is today. And yeah, I feel yeah. like Taylor Swift is probably in a good position to really have authority to talk about, um, you know, how it is today. Yeah. Um, you know, well, I guess especially for, for the bigger artists. Um, <laughs> you know, just, just some throwaway things. I, I thought it was quite interesting that she said, um, you know, like, you, you don't really notice it, but, you know, aut no one asks for autographs anymore. They just want a selfie. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, that's a completely different thing. Um, yeah. You know, the fan power... Um, you know, she's part of a generation where, yeah, like, you know, the artists, the artists get record deals because they've been able to grow an audience, um, you know, not the other way around, which I, I think is a, 
um, from my point of view, that's that's probably a good thing as well. Um, and she did. There, there was also one point at the end there. She 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 talked about genre distinction and how yeah. that was going away. So I, I thought it was a really yeah a, a really kind of positive piece and and quite good overall. Nice, nice. And uh, uh, next, I wanted to uh, talk about Samsung. So Samsung has uh, uh, kind of had a bit of a muddy approach to its music strategy or, or, uh, over the last few months, just because of uh, different partnerships and some servicing closing down and uh, a new partnership springing up. Uh, but Milk is something that seems to be set to stay. So they announced Milk uh, uh, South by Southwest, actually. Uh, and since then, uh, they now uh, said it's been downloaded two million times, the app. Uh, of course, uh, Milk is only available on Samsung devices in the US at the moment it is powered by uh, slacker radio so essentially it's, it's, it's a white label uh, offering from slacker uh, to uh, samsung and, and it's uh, got an interesting interface which is uh, essentially a dial that allows you to browse through a selection of uh, over 200 stations so um uh, Samsung is pushing on Milk uh, and uh, they just released uh, a new advert uh, which is uh, starring John Legend, Lady Antebellum, and Chromio, Iggy Azalea with Charlie uh, XCX, uh, Charlie Gambino, Cold War Kids and Little Dragon. So uh, a star-studded uh, uh, commercial with also some interesting up-and-coming artists there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just a, an interesting proposition but I just don't understand what the tactic is here. Uh, in the US uh, since uh, Slacker is not available anywhere else and Samsung is a very international company so they're going to have a hard time exporting the product uh, it's going to be hard for them to retain the customers that they already get uh, uh, that have Samsung phones because of course there are other services out there that are more widely used like Pandora and also they plan to start charging for this uh, uh, once uh, you know the, the, the trial uh, period essentially is over and so it's going to be a, a ad free paid uh, $4 a month I think uh, from what I read a few months ago a subscription and it's going to be a, a free ad supported uh, play as well so uh, with all that said uh, you know why do you think Samsung still wants to play a role in, in uh, the internet radio space in the States uh, and uh, uh, can it catch on uh, Theta honestly 2 million downloads since was March? you know what since this March yeah. that's not an awesome number I wouldn't if I'm Samsung I'm not jumping up and down about that um, uh, Frankly, uh, uh, it, it, it's an app. It yeah. should be, if they want to be in the music, they should, it should be completely embedded as part of the workflow of the phone itself. Um, I think they have a, I think they have a long road to climb um, to compete against Pandora. Um, and ultimately, you know, they're on an Android uh, they're on an Android device. When yeah. when the new YouTube subscription service comes, or Google Play fi finally figures out how that's going to work, they're going to be competing against uh, the the operating software provider uh, <laughs> in the music space. So it, it's it's going to certainly be yeah. challenging for them. I mean, I think the reason why they want to be in the space is because they've seen how other um, uh, telcos have bundled music to keep their, you know, to keep churn down so that people will actually not switch their phone service yeah. uh, um, because it comes as part of their bundle. Yeah. And I think that's very attractive. Um, but to have it be a standalone app within uh, that you basically have to get from the Android store. Mm, I'm wondering how much uh, how much real estate Android is going to be putting towards the new YouTube subscription service. So yeah, you I actually know. you raise an excellent point there because of course if you are if you're Apple and uh, you're not worried about you know customers are essentially uh, wheeled into your ecosystem you know they, they can't leave. Uh, whilst if you are Samsung as a manufacturer, essentially all the apps on the Android system are available on all Android phones. And so how can you differentiate yourself and ensure that when the new sexy Android phone comes along uh, users aren't all going to switch uh, to another brand and I guess offering an app that is only available on your device uh, is one way of going about it but uh, Dave do you think that's that's a wise move? Yeah I mean it's it's, it's kind of a tricky thing for Samsung right I mean the uh uh, again, I, I do sometimes glaze over these pieces because it feels like in the last six years you've just kind of seen this same story repeat Happen itself. All over it, again, yeah. I, I remember, you know, there, there was days when I was uh, working digital distribution and we were always getting new deals coming through from, um, you know, from Vodafone or Nokia had a service, or it was like, you know, all the ISPs were trying to get into music because they realized they needed that part to, you know, reduce churn and all of these kind of strategic reasons. And they would, you know, go and either license a white labeled service or they would quietly 
slightly by a music service that you know like was struggling a little bit and they would package it up you know do some exclusives you pay their advances to the labels and then quietly two years later you'd, you'd read another article that said oh this this music service is shut down yeah. so i mean don't get me wrong i you know i think everyone welcomes new music services um and reaching new audiences like if if they do have a, a group of users who you know they can they can um you know get into spending money on music then that's a that that should be welcomed by everyone yeah um but yeah i mean it is it is difficult i mean look at look at what happened to nokia I mean, that wasn't the, the, the best story for a number of different exactly. reasons. I think, I think Mark Mulligan, again, wrote a really great piece about how um, so Samsung's, Samsung is now you know, pretty much the leader, I think, in the, in the smartphone business. Um, but the smartphone business is quite tricky. It's not like the TV business right. where they put out good hardware, someone buys it at quite a high price, and it's, it's quite stable. They just need to kind of you know, innovate again on the hardware within you know, three or four years. The smartphone business is people are replacing handsets 12 months. It's a very fashion-driven um, market. So the, the tricky thing for them is like how do they stop themselves just being a dumb device? Yeah. Because if this is just like a dumb device, you know how are they competing against you know other uh, other players who have the devices but also have a, a content and services strategy? Yeah. Um, and if you look at the other people in the space, you you have the Apples, Googles, and Amazons who are all in you know kind of you know doing their own device plays, but have also done more to nail their content and and services strategies. So I think it's yeah I think it's a, a tricky spot for them. Yeah, um, you know they I think. This, they're really going to need to execute on this and, and get it right or, or change their strategy at some point. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, you know, uh, talking, I wanted to uh, avoid actually this week, I'm going to avoid it. I had it in the lineup, but I don't want to talk about it. Uh, I've, I've been, I'm so sick of it. Uh, the YouTube controversy, it's been something that literally we we almost opened with that every week in the last uh, uh, six, seven weeks since since it broke. So I'm going to sidestep that. There have been a few developments, but nothing that you can't catch up on on next week's show. And I'm sure there'll be more developments then. And actually, there's nothing of note to talk about there. And I wanted to close the show actually by uh, talking about Rap Genius. So uh, Rap Genius has announced closing a deal with Warner Chapel, which means that the service now has deal with all three major publishers, including UMPG and Sony ATV. Uh, the popular lyrics annotation service buried the hatchet with the NMPA uh, just a few months ago and uh, is making progress towards properly licensing the content on the site. Uh, of course, the rap genius did need some good good publicity after the uh, resignation of one of his co-founders and one of his most visible spokespersons uh, uh, who posted the crass annotations on the Santa Barbara uh, shooter manifest on Rap Genius itself. Uh, and so this is good news for the service, you know, it gets them back on track, uh, gets, gets people talking about them uh, you know, in a positive light. And so, uh, Dave, what do you make of the meteoric rise of Rap Genius and, and its future, especially considering that now it is becoming a licensed service and, it, and actually seems to be uh, heading towards the sustainable path at this point? Yeah, I mean, Rap, Rap Genius is a yeah very interesting service. I don't, I'm, I'm not a big user of it myself, but right. um, I remember visiting their offices last year and was, yeah, was. I mean, they, they've had a lot of missteps, but the the people that I met there all were like so passionate about what they were doing. Um, yeah, still scratching my head about how they managed to raise 15 million so early on from some from and Andres and Horowitz, but um, you know, at least they're they're now kind of. You know, presumably using that to you know make some deals yeah. so that um, you know this is this is a you know a business uh, you know a business that can go forward um, you know in the right ways hopefully. So I'm I'm really I, I can imagine it was probably quite a fraught process um, you know dealing with the publishers and yeah. I can imagine they were coming at it from a you know a completely different perspective to the the publishers were coming at it. So um, yeah, I'm quite pleased to hear that they've. They've they've met each other in the middle and um, yeah I'd I'd love to hear hear more about what Theta thinks yeah absolutely and I feel that like uh, from your perspective it's a it's a very new medium uh, also as far as you know the engagement of fans is concerned and, and uh, we haven't seen any, many other sexy lyric sites come up uh, like this that drive engagement so uh, how how do you see this perhaps affecting the way that you promote artists or the, or the way that artists inter interact with their fan base directly. I think it's pretty interesting because we uh, last year we did an informal survey amongst our interns, and Rap Genius came back as their favorite place to learn about new music, mm. and um, and I, I 
I thought that was particularly interesting. Um, uh, and again, you know, the, the, our interns are probably, the, they have their antennas up. They're very engaged around music. They want to work and have careers in music. So I thought it was particularly interesting that how they're using that as a, as a discovery platform, because that's not really what I thought it was for. I thought it right. was, did I get this lyric right? Particularly um, uh, for some, some artists that don't enunciate or they rap a little too fast or, or I'm just not with the lingo. Um, um, I just just not really sure what is he really saying in that song. So I think it's particularly interesting how the service itself kind of grew off of that conversation of people. What are they really saying? And now that these publishing deals are done, it's like, okay, here are the lyrics. This is what it is. Where is the space for that conversation and the debate that made the that site so sticky amongst people uh kind of earning cred by by being able to interpret the lyrics. So I, I'm I'm wondering if this really changes the direction for, for Rap Genius. Um, because well, the thing that made it great was everyone debating what the lyrics really were about. I mean I think that I think that the, the issue with the licensing deals is the fact that they had the lyrics on the site. And essentially, you know, you just hovered on the parts that were highlighted that had a comment on to read the comment from from the user or yeah. even from the artist directly. So I guess the problem that the publishers had that was that and why the NMPA actually put them on the top of their infringers list was the fact that uh, they didn't have the deals to actually display those lyrics on the site in the first place. So now that they do have those deals, I'm not sure how that's going to change the service. It might have to change the way they monetize it for sure. <laughs> but yeah, how they exactly how they mon it's, you know how they are going to monetize it is going to definitely have impact on what the service is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and so you know, uh, and that's always the question mark with lyric sites because of course you know the licensing deals are not that cheap and and advertising is relatively cheap these days. Yeah. Despite but I mean, it, it felt to me, and again, not not being not being close enough and not being kind of very deep in, in the rap genius community, I don't know this for a fact, but it, it to, to me, it felt like, um, you know, this wasn't just, you know, a lyric site trying to do something and, you know, like optimizing it for SEO and getting traffic and just selling like, you know, terrible advertising. And it's, you know, <laughs> one of those, you know, nasty internet businesses that just sits there and, you know, creams money off, off Google AdWords. Um, you know, it felt like this was just genuinely okay this is a place where we want to build a community around the yeah. stories and the culture that is yes. involved around these songs and these artists and you know they they would have you know when, when I was over in the offices you know they just had a couple of artists in and the artists themselves were engaged and you know and for them you know if if you're you know if you're someone putting down those lyrics or you you know you're you're producing that music like that's really important it's like that's that's your thoughts. That's your song there, and like to have the community kind of commenting on it, and you to put put that forward. I mean, it's a really valuable like piece of culture. So it's that seems like a, a much different thing to hey, I'm a lyric site. I'm using your um, you know IP, and I'm you know making money off it. So that's that's why I'm glad that they they hopefully there's a a deal that's been done that will also make sure it's sustainable, yeah. and that you know that th those costs aren't going to. Um, you know, reduce or, or kind of make it more of a commercial service, um, you know, so that you, you kind of lose the culture part. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, worth pointing out that this is a three major publishers. Uh, there are thousands of publishers in the United States that they need to get deal with to, to, to actually uh, make sure that all the content is uh, is OK to be on the side. And, uh, you know, I, one of the only ways to really do this in the U.S. Uh, these days is really to go through a HFA or one of the other companies that can help you get those deals done. So we'll see whether they do that and how that uh, whole conversation plays out uh, uh, eventually. And I think we've come to the end of the show. It was a relatively light uh, show news wise but it was absolutely a pleasure having you both on and hear, uh, hearing what you're up to. Uh, you know, once again, uh, Dave, it's uh, uh, makeshift.io, uh, right? Yep, yep. Perfect. And uh, Theta, for you, uh, universalrepublic.com? Uh, RepublicRecords.com. RepublicRecords.com, sorry. <laughs> I knew I would get one wrong. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, uh, it's all right. Again, it was uh, such a pleasure having you on, and uh, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, and, and, and Joe, can I just say if there's if there's any kind of like music startups or people in the world that um um yeah, I'm kind of in in the mode of um looking for people to help and have coffee with if they're in London or uh make any connections. So um yeah, if anyone wants to hit me up then um yeah, just reach out to me on Twitter and I'd I'd love to chat. 
That's perfect. And I've also got both your uh, Twitter handles at the bottom of uh, uh, the screen uh, and they're going to be in the show notes so people can check those out. And thanks so much for listening to the show as well. Uh, DMT comes out every week. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com. And of course, uh, if you uh, came across the show by chance on YouTube or on other channels, make sure you subscribe somewhere so you can keep up to date with what's going on and uh, you can keep receiving the shows uh, week on week. Uh, Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until next time.